Chris, thanks so much for joining me. Really looking forward to this conversation today. You're in the process of finalizing your memoir, Walking with Giants, a memoir on a four decade career working with literal industry giants, and arguably you're one of them. The process must have been quite personal. Can you tell me a little bit about like what it's been like going back over your own life and reflecting on that and then writing about it? I'd love to hear sure. what that's been like. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a pretty humble guy. I don't brag. I don't really let my work stand on its own. Right. And so almost to a fault, to be honest. So when I was young, I developed a mentor protege relationship with a, with a guy who was like a highly respected arranger, trombone player, a guy named Bill, Billy Byers, Broadway arranger. And he took me under his wing and I ended up working with him as a peer for 15 years. Mm. And so he was about 20 years older than I was. Right. So I developed relationships not only with his clients, people like Shirley MacLaine and Julie Andrews and all of those kinds of people, I got to know the musicians. So the kind of the impetus of this book was to say, I have, I am a conduit, experiential conduit to the previous generation. Mm. So my personal experience is working with these amazing people as a peer, as a very young guy. Right. And they're almost all of them are gone now. Mm. So the other side of the part of this is as a young musician at that time in the 70s and into the 80s to gain success in the music industry, it was you had to run a gauntlet. Right. But it was very well defined. And on the job training was kind of part of the deal. Right. So you go out on the road and you get your, your act together and then you're ready to to deal with the challenges of dealing in Hollywood or film or what, whatever it is that you're going to be doing. In today's world, it's next to impossible to find an opportunity to provide that experiential learning uh, situation. Right. Right. right? It's, there's just no access to it because the world has changed mm. to where we're talking to you right. through, right. A, through a, a, a phone right. <laughs> right. online in real time, and you're probably four or 5,000 miles away from me, right. right? 50 years ago, that technology did not exist, right? Right. So everything is kind of pushed into, into the home, isolated. Think about this, every laptop, yeah. app, sure. app, you know, MacBook Pro has GarageBand. That means that there's 1.5 billion mm. home studios. Right, right. 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 So it's that the whole dynamic has changed. So the impetus behind the book was to say, what is missing from, or ask the question, what is missing from this new environment? Mm. And it's kind of an outgrowth of, of teaching. Right. When I was teaching at the University of Miami. I discovered that, that my students were not so much interested in craft and technique. They were more interested in what was the life like? Mm. What did it feel like? Right. What was it like being in that situation? Yeah. So I've never been shy about sh uh, sharing myself with others. Yeah. Right. And so I figured, well, this could be, if I were to outline my career and the challenges that I faced and, and the shifts and ch changes along the way that I had to adapt to, mm -hmm. if I could share that process with people, right. it could give them hope and confidence right. that, well, gee, if he could do it, I could do it now right. that I understand what what the, the deal is, right. as opposed to being being one step removed. So right. tell me a bit about the Billy Byers relationship. Like, how did that influence who you've even become? Like, you've. Oh, my God, I, I would not have had the life that I had without him. Mm. I mean, it's just pure and simple. Right. I, I met him when I was 17 years old at a clinic that he was teaching in Las Vegas. I was living in Ogden, Utah at the time. My family right. was. So I go to this clinic and I see this guy sitting in the front of this room. It was like kind of like a stadium seating uh, right. like classroom. And he's sitting down in the front. And you have to remember, you know, the context of this is my dad was a rocket scientist. Cool. Truly, truly a rocket scientist. He yes. built rocket engines. Yeah. And so, you know, my home life was basically buzz cuts, short sleeve dress shirts and pocket right. protectors. Right. Right. You know, that's the world that I came from. Yeah. But now I'm 17 years old and I walk into this room and I see this guy. He's wearing a little John Lennon 
sunglasses. Nice. nice. <laughs> holding his cigarette like this. Right, 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 right. And he had ponytail. He was like in his 40s at this time. A ponytail down in the middle of his back. And it's like, oh my God, what in the world is this all about? Right, right? Right. Then he picked up his trombone and there was a, I just distinctly remember somebody had written a lead trumpet part. Now mm -hmm. for the non-musicians, trombone basically plays an octave lower right. than the trumpet. So there's a screaming high trumpet part written out on the board, right? right. That, you know, like up, an octave above the staff that would be a challenge for most trumpet players. And he picks up his trombone and he plays it on the trombone. And my mind is completely blown. Right. So I was placed in his class. I had no idea what he was talking about. I took mm -hmm. about the notes of about two inches thick and then went, spent the next six months trying to understand what it was he was talking about. And I went back and did the clinic the next year. And he said, well, I decided to go to Cal State Northridge in LA. Give me a call when you get to town, we'll hang out. <laughs> I was like terrified, you know, right. it's like, how yeah. do I even make that phone call? Right, right. right. How do I you know, it's like, so as, as it turns out, he had a legendary Sunday hang. Mm. It, was, it was all about the other guys in the band. So whenever uh, musicians would come into town and uh, from the road, you know, visiting, they'd all go out to his place on right. Sunday afternoons and have a barbecue and yeah. drink and hang right. out and do, you know, do that whole, whole vibe. Well, I ended up getting in on the tail end of that. Right, right. So I was depressed living away from home for the first time. And I ended up eating Sunday dinner with his family for the next two years. Right, wow. And after we had dinner, the kids, the little kids would go to bed and then we put on headphones and listen to records and drink wine. I and that it. was my education. So right. he taught me as much how to hang out yeah. as he did about music. So, right. I love so that's it. how that's how the relationship started. And then as time progressed, he was really, really busy and he would bring me along and ask, you know, dole out little small little assignments to me right along the way. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, tell me a bit about this. I wonder if you can recall it. The score from the Sandpiper, Johnny Mandel, mm -hmm. Billy may or may not have had a score that you did and gave it to Johnny? Could you? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Johnny Mandel, like a legendary composer, songwriter, and Billy, Billy were lifelong friends. They right. actually were uh, staff arrangers on your show of shows with Sid Caesar in the early 50s. For people who don't know what that show was all about, the writer's room was Woody Allen, Neil Simon, Dave. But in any case, these, these, all these people, Carl Reiner right. was another one, right? right. So sure. all these, like, like these guys, like went on to have these amazing careers yeah. after this. Yeah. So Billy had played, one of the records we listened to was the score to the Sandpiper, which is right. the shadow of your smile. I listened to this and I completely wigged out. It's like, oh my God, this is, you know, this is the Great. shit. This is, this is, this is, yeah. this is, this, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm hearing in my head. This is yeah. what, you know, and I ended up wearing out a cassette tape. It ended up breaking because I listened to it so often. That's amazing. Right? <laughs> That's amazing. So I was playing in a, a big band at LA City College, uh, playing piano. Mm. And I ended up writing a, taking all of what I had absorbed from right. listening to this score for, right. for so long and try to approximate that, to imitate it to, right. to, in, in my own composition. Right. Yeah. So cool. So I took it, I would, as part of what I would do is if I wrote something, I would take it out and have Billy take a look at it and give right. me a critique, right? So one Sunday I bring him, I bring out this, this chart and it's written in manuscript paper, right? So it was not unheard of for Johnny to just show up at Billy's front door. Nice. They were neighbors. Yeah, nice, right? nice. So Billy looked at it and then he says, oh, gee, that looks great. And then we're, we're hanging out and all of a sudden Johnny walks in the door. Right. And without saying anything else, Billy handed my score <laughs> to Johnny. <laughs> and he says, here, take a look at this. Right. All right. Well, the, the standard for people in that role would be, was to, you know, hear with your eyes, see with your ears, mm. meaning look at a piece of music and be able to hear it in your head right. or hear a piece of music and then be able to visualize what it looked like notated. Right. So he hands my score to Johnny and Johnny lays down on the couch 
and he's got his head on the, on on a pillow and his feet up and he holds the score up above his head and he's like reading through it right and like and like all the, all the while i'm like sweating bullets you know right. here, my idol, here my idol is looking yeah. at a work that i've created right. to, to approximate what he does right right and High so, stakes. well, yeah, you bet. <laughs> so, so he gets to the end of it and he puts the score down and he says, he says looks like something I would have liked to have written. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So, that is cool. Very cool. What role does mentorship play in your life now? Um, fast forward. Um, that experience, like, yeah. How do you think about mentorship? Well, you know, my experience is, is you know, fairly unique. Not to say that mentorship is unique, but if you look at it from a historical perspective, how were trades and crafts passed along mm. before organized education? Right. In master apprentice. True. Right. You know, is a way that people learn through, right. through experience with a guy looking over your shoulder. True. Yeah. So all of what I've been given through all these remarkable people that I've known and worked with it's like, like I say, there's no opportunity to get that on the job training no. as there once was. Right, right. So I view it as the other part about this is I don't feel possessive mm. about what I know. Right. It's the reality is that the music that I write isn't, is not really mine. It comes from someplace else. Right. So how in the world could I even begin to feel like I own it or right. it's, you know, yeah. You know, it's just something that's there that I tap into and, and can and access. It's just and you're not possessive about any ideas like you've had a blog, you've got courses. Oh, you've no, 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 no. I'm absolutely fearless about it because yeah. why limit yourself? Right. You right. know, it's just like the venue, the the focus shifts. But the message is still the same, which is mm -hmm. to say, take let me expose you to what I've learned and then you take what's valuable for you and and integrate it as you see fit to your work right which Why then perpetuates yeah. it's just kind of continues the thread right right why do you do it why do you like from the music to the ideas like the blog so many insights why why do you continue to create and share these ideas all for the world to, to see well i don't know if i have an, an answer for you but i mm. can i can kind of characterize it by someone who once told me you didn't choose music music chose you from a musical side of things is such a huge part of who i am i've just learned through trial and error and self-destructive behavior that it's more powerful than me and because of that i've made peace with that concept mm. that this is just who i am i'm much better off just going with it yeah. rather than trying to control it. Right. 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 And you know, it's like, if you have a story to tell, if you have a, something that you feel passionate about, then the venue, the focus is kind of irrelevant. It's like I had an experience when my mother passed away, Satari experience that shifted the, the direction of my life completely. Mm. And it was such a powerful event for me that I felt compelled to share that story, right? I just had to get all that energy. Now, you know, the reality is I'm very empathetic mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm kind of like a sponge right. to all of that energy that's yeah. around me, you know, right. positive and or negative. Yeah. And so it's being creative as a way to expunge that energy, right. because if I don't, it just eats me up alive. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I can't be where I want to be, which is in the process of making stuff. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So I, I made an album of solo piano music about that experience, which taught me how to be present in the moment with no thought and just allow it to, to express itself however it is without having any sort of, of ego attached to it. And then about two years later, I realized three years later, I wasn't done telling that story. I hadn't mm -hmm. finished getting this story out of myself with the hope that it would affect somebody else in a positive way. Right. So I wrote a one act play and I produced it and I directed it right. Right. about that experience. Amazing. I didn't have any fear about it because, you know, it's like, what is it? Failure is just another learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So, so if in fact it failed, that's an expectation not met. It, mm. it doesn't necessarily have any sort of judgment. The only judgment that's attached to it is whatever you choose it to be. Right. 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 You know, so if you choose to, to have an expectation that if the project succeeds, then I'll be a success. I'll be a whole person. If it right. fails, you're like in the toilet. Right. 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 If you walk into it saying, this is what I'm trying to do, let's see what the outcome will be. Then you can judge the success or failure of the expectation that you had set mm. set from a completely different perspective. Is this the same mentality that you would have had when you first met Billy? Like, well, you know, no, well, not really. That's when, this is, and when this, did this, when did the shift happen? Like, when were you more comfortable with failure and got to a point where you were like, where you had that perspective, like how long did that take and when did it really come out of you? When, now, you have to remember that I was 20 years old when I did my first network TV arrangement. Right, right. right? So early, right in the, right in the weeds. I was, I, was a, I was a baby. Baby, right? yeah. <laughs> Music, and I had a very challenging for me dysfunctional family situation. Mm, they yeah. didn't know what to do with an artist. So there was this big disconnect. For me, combining this access and this kind of meteoric rise in the business, right. I was so desperate to do the work mm. because it protected me from the dysfunctional childhood. Right. Interesting. Right? Right. right. So when I met Billy, it's like, oh my God, this is going to be a ticket to me being able right. to to survive all of this internal struggle and pain that I was feeling because of my childhood. Mm. So that became like the, and I was, you know, I had never failed at anything before, right? right. So everything was, everything had worked out. Then I, and then I got hired to be Tom Jones, musical director. Mm. I was 23 years old. Right. And I, I walked in and they flew me up to Quebec and this is like hard to imagine, but they had sent me a tape of the show, flew me up to Quebec to join this tour to replace his, his musical director. And I watched, there was two shows that night. I watched right. the first show and musical director, Johnny Spence, he said, well, you ready? Right. And I said, yeah, I think so. So I went into his dressing room and I, and I went through, tried to prep for, for, you know, being the, the leader of this show. Right? right. And I walked out and it was flawless and it scared the crap out of everybody. Right. Right. Who is this kid? Yeah. yeah. Right. They could not really accept wow. me because it triggered them in all their insecurities and all right. this craziness. Yeah. Then three days later, Johnny died. He died of a died of a, a heart attack, and he was the glue that held this whole thing together. Mm. So now the, the the wheels fell off, and I felt like you know, obligated to finish the tour and amidst this chaos. You know, I mean, it was it was really bad. It was I mean, a lot. It was really really bad. What and, was the chaos like? The actual show just went oh out. no 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 it was all it was all personal. You know, personal. they they all adored Johnny right right, and when he passed away, so there's all that grief associated right. with his passing right. mm -hmm. that manifested itself in belligerent behavior in alcoholism wow. in drug abuse yeah. and all of that kind of insanity right, right. while they're your fighting 20s. we're doing one-nighters mind you right right you're in your we're, 20s doing all of this i'm 23 inheriting it from a 40-some director with experience correct and so now you're, you're, you're in a leadership role now and I was, you know, emotionally, I was just not there. 23. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, musically, it was not an issue. Right. Musically, it was like, ah, no problem. But the emotional aspect of being in that role and the challenges from a managerial leadership role, I was just not prepared to deal with. Right. So I ended up developing a bleeding ulcer and lost two pints of blood and ended up leaving the tour, uh, being admitted to a hospital in Terre Haute, Indiana. Spent a week in the hospital. Never spoke to them again. They just left. Right. Right. And so that kind of shaped going forward to the extent of where I really realized I had to take care of myself. Right. And I bet mid. when you're in the hospital, did they uh, encourage you to shake it off and come back? No, no, no. So I, the one confidant that I had on the tour was a woman named Jeannie King, who was okay. part of the Blossom singing group, who, who did all the Phil Spector records in the 60s. And, right. 
And I just went to her at four o'clock in the morning and says, I can't go on. I can't right. go on, right? Because I felt like I had a knife from my sternum to my groin, right? And so she took me to the hospital and they admitted me. And she actually went back to the hotel and got my luggage and brought my luggage to the hospital, wow. right? Wow. So the next morning, the Tom's manager called me up and he says, hey, you're going to be able to make the show tonight? Right. And I've got an IV in one arm and blood going in the other arm. And I said, gee, I really don't think so. Don't think it's going to happen. He no. Said, All right. And he hangs up the phone. And that was the last I ever heard. That was it. That was That's it. it. That's wild. Yeah. That so, you know, it's a, it's a brutal business. So when you're, you're 23 and you're going through that, like what's in your mental at that point? You just were well, uh, arguably I, to everyone else. It's like, oh, you've got your own with Tom Jones. Like this is... Well, there was that, there was that, but, but I didn't do much of anything for the next six months. Right. Is trying to absorb mm. the experience into, you know, how do I fit in what happened? Right. right. You know, what was, what, what was I responsible for? What was I not responsible for? Right. And to get back to your original question, that experience happened twice, subsequently happened twice in 1986. I got an Academy Award nomination for my work on The Color Purple. Right. I, I won another Emmy Award and I had an album, a hit album on jazz radio and I got divorced and I instantly became a single parent. And so, so I realized that for my own survival, I needed to focus on being a parent rather than a career. So, so that was the next evolution of survival as it relates to career and personal health and mental health and all right. that. The last experience was kind of a carryover. I decided to leave the band that I was in mm. and do a solo record. And I funded it myself. I put a great band together right. and I had some partners trying to get me a record deal. The record comes out two weeks after it's released. It's in the top 20 mm. uh, airplay. Right. And my partner got into an, uh, a spat with the record company and the record company pulled all their promotional support. So the album failed. Right. It, it just, it just, no dis it just disappeared. Right? right. And that was, I had to accept the fact that the failure had nothing to do with me, that it was completely mm. out of my control. Right. And that pushed me into going into therapy that started a, the divorce concurrent with the failure of this project pushed me to say what I had been doing was not no longer working. And if I wanted to survive in this, in this case, I support and care for my son, I had to change to be able to accommodate that. So, That's fascinating. Like, yeah. so for someone who's listening, like there's a lot of people who still even today, like therapy's kind of like, oh, there's still the stigma. Someone yeah. who's trying and has achieved a lot. You're sitting on top of the world. You just win, you're winning awards, working on color purple. In all eyes, perfect. Life is great. Other people listening to this might be in a similar situation. They're getting all the awards. They're doing everything right. The outside perspective is everything is great. But internally, they're struggling. They're going through it. What would be your advice to those people who's balancing the ego with the reality and resisting the idea of even getting help? Such a great question. There's a lot to about that. I'm always reminded of something that Quincy Jones has said, and I'll paraphrase this. Is, My self-worth is not dependent upon your justification. Of Ooh, that's good. Deep. Right. That is deep. He was a very deep guy. So, so to kind of drill down into that is the fact that what I've learned is that my identity as a human being has very little to do with the work that I do. Who I am as a person is separate from what it is that I do. It's inextricably linked, but what that having that distinction or creating that distinction allows you to be able to look at the work from a third party perspective. It's you're not looking for the work to prop you up and to make you whole. Right. So to answer your question, what would I suggest is use that as a mantra to say, I am a whole person. I have a family. I have friends uh, or not friends or whatever, whatever your situation may be. Who you are as a person and how you feed your soul has nothing to do with external reward. 
That way, you now you have a buffer. You can clarify what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for. I mean, this is a lesson that it's been a struggle for me to get to this level of understanding. Now, the whole thing about mental health is stigma is a brand. I mean, that's where the word is derived from. It's a brand. It's a brand. So in this case, this brand or stigma about mental health is derived from ignorance. It's ignorance and not understanding, as well as in this country, the healthcare system is so distorted. You know, we can talk about the effectiveness. That's a different issue. That's like an execution right. sort of thing. But if you think about it, the healthcare industry profits mm. by treating symptoms. Right. Not by curing people. Right. So it's set up as a profit generator mm. as opposed to creating wellness, which is 180 degrees right. from Asian medicine. Right. Which right. they pay the doctor every week. Right. So they don't get sick. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so the outgrowth of that is that we are culturally taught that we go to a doctor to get fixed. Right. Right. Like you go to a body shop or to a mechanic to put in a new muffler, right? right? Right. That's the mindset behind the healthcare industry that we have adopted. And when you talk about, you can talk about white coat syndrome, right? You know, the, the, the guy in the white coat, he knows all, right? right. right. So I have no voice in this. No. I am a non-participant in this process. So this is a little while I had this epiphany earlier this spring that the word using the term mental health is perpetuates by uh, the stigma of, of it being something bad mm. because it's derived from the cultural aspect of the healthcare system that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, right. Right? Healthcare, oh, I got to go fix, call a doctor. Yeah. Mental health, oh, I don't understand it at all. Well, then I'm, there must be something wrong with me, so right. I better figure out. And then you have the fear of, you know, the, the reality is, is, is that, I mean, this is just astonishing to me. 40% of the people who are treated with uh, uh, pharmacology, you know, like mm. antidepressive medication yeah. or cognitive behavioral therapy, which is talk therapy right. for, for the most part, you know, yeah. broader than that, 40% of those people, it's ineffective. Yeah. 40%, it doesn't work. No. Yeah. Right. So now you have all this fear and anxiety and all the rest of this. And it, as a result of the pandemic, Right. We've got more than 60 million people who are suffering in this country mm, right. who have no place to turn. The demand for services far outstrips the supply. Supply, of, yeah. Right? And so now we're in this, this quagmire. Where do we go? What do we do? Right? It's kind of like an extension of my own personal growth. Mm. But for the last two and a half years, my focus has been to create a, a self-care method for people to alleviate, be able to manage their mental health organically to alleviate the onset of symptoms. Now, and is that what the missing link project? That is, is exactly what the missing link project is. It's, right. there's, a, there's two aspects of it. There's what I call an outreach program and there's a concert. Now the concert right. was designed to, how do I get people to go to the concert hall? That right. was where it started. Right. And so I created a, I couldn't find anybody to collaborate with me who understood what I was talking about. So yeah. I ended up writing a 75 page script cool. with five characters, nice. two families that it starts following a school shooting where uh, one of the families loses teenage son, right. a black woman and the younger brother, is, right. that's one family. And she, the, the uh, black woman, Vanessa is a, uh, Mm. Or widow, she's you know. So the yeah. older brother was the father figure in the household, right? So the younger brother is like, you know, he's the, he's like wigging out completely. Mm. And this, right. The other family is a white girl and a couple. The dad is a business owner who has PTSD from military service, mm. and an enabler as a wife. And right. the, the girl and the boy have a relationship unbeknownst to the parents. Mm, right. All right. So that's where this story starts. It right. goes and then the pandemic hits and then right. the wheel and then it goes through this whole character development. Mm. Basically, the the mission of this work is to bring people together in the concert hall as a community engagement vehicle. Right. To break down the walls and educate communities mm. about the hidden effects of trauma so that we can create a dialogue and connect right. people one 
to another. Love it. The outreach program is designed to use music, movement, and uh, breathing right. to provide, this is kind of a technical term, you know, getting <laughs> in the weeds, but provide alternative sensory data mm. to the brain to counteract PTSD or trauma or anxiety by, right. by having a, a go-to device to mitigate the fight flight response, right. which is instinctive that you don't have conscious control over. Right. Right. So it's in essence, it's involved and there's all sorts of neuroscience and, uh, to, to back up why this works. Right. But the point here is, is to give people a coping skill yep. and use the power of music right. as a healing mechanism as right. opposed to an entertainment or an mm -hmm. anecdotal resource or something that you unconsciously gravitate towards with you don't that you don't right. understand. Right. And in many ways, it's kind of also rooted in some of the stuff you were talking about around your childhood. Like you use the work to be like your escape from a, a rough oh, childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all connected. Yeah, it's, it is it's, all connected. It's, it's all connected. And so, you know, when I left the University of Miami in 2018, well, a year before that, I was terrorized by a boss in a narcissistic rage that to the extent that I felt my life was threatened. Really? And I ended up developing PTSD as a result. Wow. And I've been in, in I have used this project to turn pain into pleasure. Right or purpose rather, but I've also done EMDR therapy mm. as a way for me to deal with my PTSD. Right. Right. So that was like the impetus. And mm. I realized when I actually left that job, my biggest question was, how do I want to spend my time? Mm. You know, it's like, okay, I got, I'm 64 years old. Right. I got X number of years left. Right. What's most important to me in terms of spending my time. Right. right. So. When I discovered that, or realized that, that my job as a film composer was to manipulate people's emotions using mm. music to support whatever the story is being told, right. I realized that I could use my musical storytelling skill to express the hidden emotional lives of trauma sufferers using story and music to break down that stigma, that wall right. of misunderstanding between people who don't suffer and those who are loath to express right. it. So that's how this whole thing started. And listen, I jokingly say I carry around a big sack mm. of, of credits. Right. Right. You know, it just kind of trails after me. There's yeah. not much I can do about it. Right. right. But the question that I asked about when I started thinking, how do I want to spend my time? Well, number one, I wanted to be around people. I wanted to work with live musicians again. Right. But more importantly, it's like I want to make an impact. Right. It's like, what can I do using my particular skills and experience right. to create a positive impact? And it's pretty selfish at the end of the day. I've got two adorable grandchildren. Love it. Congrats. They're six Congrats. and three. Nice. And it's like I look at them in their lives and I see what's coming with AI and all right. the rest of that. And I think, what can I do to help the world that they will mm -hmm. inherit? What do you think is coming to for that generation in the next wave? Like when you think of the original types of experiences that you would have had with like Billy. Exactly. Right. Fast forward to today, AI is starting to take off. A lot of music is being developed, even with AI. Like, what are you, what are you seeing in as the outcome of all of this technology and what the future might? Well, be? first and foremost, selling a piece of plastic or a string isn't is the tail end of a 20th century marketing model, right? Right. Expecting that you can create a career of selling a piece of plastic as that being the primary value that you're creating, it's a non-starter, right? Right. It just doesn't exist. So for the last 15, almost 20 years, my question I've been asking is how do you change the value proposition, mm. right? Into something that's meaningful and relevant to an audience. Right. And there is no specific answer no. for that, but from a business perspective, that's the question you have to ask. What is the value that you're creating? Right. It's not just look at me, look at me, look at me. Right. right. Who cares? You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're saturated with media. Yep. So have to understand yourself to know what is it that you do that nobody else does. Mm. 
and do, and then ask yourself the question does that what value does that create for someone else right in I'm sorry, go ahead you had a question no, i was going to say when when you think about like the process of composing or even like bring to life one of those amazing scores and now people being able to say hey i need a score of ai create me something what do you think is going to happen long term to well i think my feeling is is that people will get bored right right you know the you listeners know, or the, the listen the listeners the, the listeners. listeners are going to get bored mm. because there is and that 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 comes in you know it touches on a much broader issue right there is a, a great author, Yuval Harari, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote two books and he does a lot of speaking, but Homo Sapiens and yep. Homo Deus. Now, yes. Homo, if you've not read Homo Deus. I've read Sapiens, but I haven't read the second Homo one. Homo Deus, is, is the subtitle is A Brief History of Tomorrow. Cool. cool. And basically, he makes a pretty darn compelling argument that the Age of Enlightenment is dying. Interesting. And that in, in layman's terms, in another 20 years, we'll all be the Borg. You know, we'll all be uh, cyborgs right. with nano, nanotechnology embedded in our bodies, which right. will extend lifespan, but it will t forever change what it means to be human. Right. And I had a, there's a, my friend Robert Tur Tursek has a great podcast called uh, The Futurists. Mm. And he had an AI researcher uh, and uh, come in and the interviewer, uh, Monica Anderson is her name. And basically what she was saying is that human knowledge is evolutionary. AI knowledge is designed. Right. Right. It's not it's the same. It's not the same thing. So no, if you true. take all of those factors together, right, the, uh, uh, the machine learning and all the rest of the AI and, and uh, nanobots and technology, you know, if you follow uh, singularity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. We're, we're heading to a singularity, which we're probably already in. Right. But, but so my question with all of that stuff is, is what is going to be the tool or the vehicle that continues to connect us as human beings? Right. Right. Because if you just, you know, in, in the early 2000s, you went know, smartphone technology was introduced. We all just kind of followed along blindly, much, yeah. right? And the social media, we followed along blindly. We didn't really know what the consequence was. Right. So now with that experience, there's a choice to be made. I see this as like a once in human history event right. where we have the ability and the opportunity to define right. what we want humanism to be. Mm, right. Remarkable. Right. You know, so it's, if you look at it from those stakes, we can either drift along and let let technology take over yeah. or we can say not necessarily put the brakes on and regulate right but to say this is our intent of what we want this to be mm. then they can we can actually define right the world that we want to live in and use the technology yeah as a support to that now back to the ai and making music and and audiences getting bored yeah i i th think that discernment between deep fake and real mm. is going to become a valuable commodity. Right. So what, what are the factors that, that you can determine? Is it glitz and glamor? Is it messaging? Mm. Is it, what is it about you that reaches you? Now it's not to say that AI can't get there eventually, nope. but, but to say that being a, aware enough of yourself to be able to say, is that something that's kind of like, like a, a 60 minute ad on network right. TV, right. or is that something that really speaks to me is going to be a skill and awareness that needs to be supported and nurtured to be able to be in control as much as we can about what the human experience will be. Now, I think that music is the key to this, right? Because music has the power. I call it a superpower now because it has the ability to change brain chemistry. It has mm -hmm. the ability to change physiology. Right. And it has the, the ability to counteract yeah. negativity. And it can transcend across language, culture. Well, orders, all of that, all but more that. importantly for the individual, I think about right. this, there's all sorts of data that supports the concept, but let's say you had a significant experience, mm -hmm. positive and or negative. Right. Like my parents used to say, say when they were dating, they would go to a dance. 
right? right. And, and the band would start playing a song and then they falling in love and they, they call they're playing our song. Right, right. Because they attach that song to that um, memory of that experience, mm-hmm. right? That indicates that if you are aware of what, how that worked, then you can use our song mm. to recreate that positive emotional experience of the past. Right. That's how powerful music is. And it's irrespective of genre. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's hip hop, if it's, if Mozart, it really doesn't matter. It's about how the individual relates or it has experienced that piece of music in the past. Yeah, no, hundred percent. It is fascinating to think about. Um, when you think of like some of the music that you've been involved with or even brought to life, does any of any particular track or like, have you developed one that stands out to you as a score that you go back to and actually still to this day point at as being like one of your, the greatest things that you brought to life. And I know you mentioned early on that you'd like to be humble, but I'd love for you to just go back into time a little bit. Is there one that stands out? Yes. But, but let me just preface this by saying I'm a jazz musician by training. Right. Which means right. I'm always looking to the next bar. Nice. I, nice. I, ne- I never really look back much. <laughs> That's cool. That's, you know, but that being said, this, this record I did uh, after my mother's passing, mm. it's called Songs from the Heart. It's on Spotify. It, okay. The experience behind it was I was my mother's emotional support for the last mm. 18 months of her life. And it was a remarkable experience. We got to know each other as people, right? as opposed to parent and child. Right. There's a lot more to the story I don't necessarily need to get into, but I brought her home to die under mm. hospice care. Right. And about four o'clock in the morning, I set up the hospital bed next to her piano, put pictures of her grandkids right. on the piano. She was, she was a, an amazing gardener. That's she cool. could see out into her, her yard and see all of her plants. Right. And I ended up playing for her all day. Mm. She had lost consciousness. Mm. And I played the piano for, for hours and hours and hours. Wow. And about four o'clock in the morning, uh, the hospice nurse said that she had passed away. I came mm. downstairs and I, I kissed her on the forehead. I'd never seen a corpse before, you know, right. so that was a new experience. Mm. I called my brother and I, and I walked out into her backyard. So I'm sitting on this bench. Yeah. Looking in at the bed, looking at all the people gathered around the bed right. and, I'm, and it's five o'clock. It's pre-dawn. Wow. Right? It's in the darkness. And I sit down and I just say to myself, okay, I knew this day would eventually get here. Right. What's next? What's going to happen next? Mm. And all of a sudden I became hypersensitive to everything around me. Mm. Started with a, a hearing a ra- raccoon in, in bushes. And it was like, it sounded like it was 120 dB. I mean, it was just right. like this, like right. this, you know, this awareness of all yeah. this. Then, then I was sitting underneath the sycamore tree and, mm. and, and I, the, just this gentle breeze through this tree. Right. It was just like the most amazing thing I'd ever experienced at all. All right. the while feeling blanketed with the, a feeling of comfort and love. Right. 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 Then this, then, it was springtime and that's now the sun starts to come up while I'm like in this state and the birds started to sing hmm. as dawn was breaking, you know, the, the world was waking up. Right. In that moment, I just became overwhelmed with the beauty in nature mm-hmm. and the abundance of life on this planet. And it just like, it was life changing. Yeah. This particular experience. Mm-hmm. So that's the backstory. Right. To this right. piece of music. It's powerful. Very powerful. The, about a year later, self-publishing was all the rage, like mm. in 2006. Yep. So I'm like investigating, well, how do I break an artist online and all those kinds of questions, you know, right. what, what is social networking anyway? Yep. You know? And I sat down at the piano and I started to play and mm. this song came out and I felt exactly the same way that I felt sitting in my mother's yard at five o'clock in the morning. Right. You know, an hour after she passed away. Fascinating. Right. And, and I thought, wow, that's different. Right. Because, you know, listen, you have to clarify you're writing orchestral music 
you got a 17, 11 by 17 inch piece of paper yeah. and you're, you're, you're envisioning, you know, 80 people sitting on a stage and right. you have to figure out what they have to do. It's a lot of work. Right. It's not necessarily a spontaneous kind of creation. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it takes a long time to put those notes on the paper. Mm-hmm. So, so it's very intellectual. Mm. It's not like, it's not an improvisation. Right. 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 Yeah. So I said, this is wild. So I went and I played it again and I said, this is pretty special. This feels right. different because I didn't have that intellectual mm. craftsman's hat on. Right. Right. That's interesting. Right. I, I was just in this state of presence, right? Right. Presence awareness or a state of flow. If you're uh, an athlete, right. 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 And so, so I ended up making, doing 14 songs. I learned how to access that state Mm -hmm. through that experience about how to play. So now, you know, Oprah uh, talks about hanging out with Tina Turner. Right. And they're in the, they're in the audience you know, while they're doing the sound check and she's just, you know, like one of the, one of the guys and she's, Oh, I got to go sing. And by the right. time that she got to the microphone, she right. became Tina Turner. Right. She was right. A different person. Different person. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of like, like an ex, you know, uh, an example of, right. of this. That's cool. So I made this record. I released it. I put it up on MySpace. in 30 days. Mm. I had 7,000 MySpace wow. friends. Love it. <laughs> and over 700 comments wow. of how this music connected, people, with, connected with people who are in life transition right. experience. Right. So, you know, I've done a lot of stuff, Yeah, you know, and, and I've had a lot of amazing experiences, but I have to say that has probably has been at least what I can quantify. Mm, you right. know, it's a lot of the stuff that I've worked on it leaves the desk and I don't think about it anymore. Right. Right. Primarily I'm not involved. Yeah. And also because I'm looking for the next job. So, right. Right. But yeah, it's called songs from the heart. And the first song that I played is called pure. Mm. And I actually gave a copy while I was making it to a neighbor who was saying that her dad was going through stage four prostate cancer. Mm. So I said, here, let me, let me go get you a CD. So I give her like a home burn CD and said, give this to your dad. He might find it helpful. Hmm. And she came back. She saw me out in the yard about a a month later. Right. And she was across the street and she made a point to cross the street to talk to me. And she said, my father wanted me to use these words. He says, he said, your music resonates with me. I listened to it every night while I was going through chemotherapy. Wow. And he, she said that he was, he had just gotten his review uh, yep. post chemo and he was cancer free. Wow. That's cool. So it's wow. like, not to say that this is a cure for cancer, no, 100%. But, but just to say that it was being, something that, yeah, on well, a journey. And, right. Yeah. And for anyone who creates art, you know, my right. definition of art is to provoke a response. Right. It's not necessarily to be rich or famous. It's the artist expresses it because they don't have no choice. They right. have to get it out of there. You know, Sinead o- O'Connor is a huge yeah. example of that. And the, the grief that she endured mm, for right. doing that was so unfounded. Right. Right. Yeah. But, but nonetheless is connect with that place that's real for you. Right. That has that authentic intent and you will find that people will resonate to it differently mm. than if you're trying to please something outside of yourself. It's interesting. You mentioned earlier, like that everywhere you go with you, you're carrying this bag of credentials and this yeah. bag of like awards, stuff, and yeah. all of this stuff. But it often like you're, what I'm hearing is like, you're pursuing that impact on the people. Some people are going to listen to this and they're like, I want the awards. And then other people are going to listen. They're going to say, I really just want the impact. What would be your advice to both of those people? So the people who are striving to kind of get the awards, they want a color purple. They want that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Land those. What would be your advice to them? And then also the people who are like still haven't found that one track that just like hits people and resonates with people to a point where they're willing to like people are listening to your tracks while they're on their deathbed. That's powerful. 
How do you get both of those people in that direction? What advice would you give for them to Well, chase okay, let's, let's, let's talk about this, searching for awards. Mm. Clamoring for awards is kind of a double-edged sword in the sense that it can be a great motivator, mm. right? To spur you into action. Right. I want to go do this because I want this outcome. There's nothing wrong with using that as a, a generator of, of your motivation. But having been on the other side of that, the award is just a reflection of somebody else's opinion. It has nothing to do with the work per se. It's somebody else's opinion about that work. And you have no control over that. Right. So if you're, you know, all well and good, you want to go win a zillion awards, that's, that's great. It's not going to make you a better person. It's not going to guarantee career success. It's just marker on your journey. So if you're going to go out and say, I'm, I really, this motivates me to go take action. Just keep that in mind. Mm. It's not going to flip your world upside down. It's not right. going to resolve all the issues that you're dragging around with you. Yeah. It will just say that you have taken that step mm. along the way. Right. Right. For and it, the flip side of that is kind of like the yin and yang to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Making an impact is an altruistic uh, a pursuit because right. it makes you feel good. If that's your motivation and that and that's your drive, what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? Do it without reservation right. and be very clear about your expectations of an outcome and why you're doing it in the first place. So for both the lane, just do it. Right. Don't right. wait for somebody to tell you it's okay. Right. Just go do it. Yeah. Because you will learn something from that process. Mm, right. You know? And I it, yeah, I mean, is this, I mean, look, look at me. I mean, I've had a lot of success, you know, accomplishment. I, would, I yep. hate to use the word success. Right. But I've accomplished a lot of things. For sure. Is basically because I'm not afraid to fail. Right. I often talk about having the courage to fail. Mm, right. As we said earlier, about separating your self-worth from the work that you do, right? There's enormous growth that will personal growth that will happen right. if you have the courage to fail. Right. Right. All that means is, oh, that didn't work. It's not the end. It right. just means that it didn't work. And the older you get, you realize that most things in life <laughs> don't work out. Right. 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 So why make such a big deal out of it? That's it. That's right? it. A hundred percent. I appreciate that. No, that's great. You mentioned Oprah and I want to go back to Oprah for a second because you folks worked on Color Purple and I was reading one of your pieces and it talked about the fact that you had a conversation with Oprah and I'd love to just hear like what that experience was like because sure. in the, the piece you talked about something around how she shows up that I think is very interesting well, so love to hear. So behind me, you can't see it here. Well, actually on the, on the wall with all the plaques, there's like a, a long rectangular picture frame. Oh yeah. yeah. And it's a portrait of the Oscar nominees luncheon mm. taken at the Beverly Hilton hotel in Beverly Hills. And all the people were nominated from the color purple. And, you know, I right. mean, it's just like all these incredible people in this thing. And so now we segue 25 years later and David Foster hired me to co-produce an album for one of his artists. Mm. And part of David was known as Benefit Boy because he would audition new talent by cool. having them appear on the benefits that he performed <laughs> at. Nice. So the act that we were working with was going to perform at the Carousel Ball, which mm. was Barbara Davis, whose husband owned 20th Century Fox at the time. It was like the premier social event right. in Beverly Hills, right? right? The Carousel Ball. I think it was diabetes is what they, what okay. they were raising money for. So I decide to say, well, I'm involved with this act. I should go support yeah. my clients and, and go hang out, right? Right. Why not? So, <laughs> so I go to the thing and, you know, there's a room full of rich, influential people. Right. And I'm sitting in the green room, which is probably about the size of this room that I'm right. sitting in now. And standing behind me is Sidney Poitier. <laughs> right. Right. Awesome. And standing in front of me is Oprah, who was right. there to give an award to Halle Berry. Wow. So I saw her and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, OK, I got to pick my spot. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she was rehearsing her remarks and 
when when she was done rehearsing and she put her hand down and she's looking around i went up to her and i introduced myself and i said i have a photo of you and me taken in this very room 25 years ago that's wild and she looked at me stunned <laughs> and said get out of town that's hilarious she, she couldn't find it right right the, crazy thing about this was her entire being was focused on me and i felt like i was at, at the right. mouth of a fire hose right right, right. right. it was so overwhelming yeah that i couldn't maintain eye contact with her right i had right. to look away it was like you know it's like what the hell was that right, right. and it's it not it wasn't it was you know it was innocuous in its oh, yeah. intent it wasn't you know, yeah. right? and then she got very reverential mm. She realized that the impact that that had had on me, right? And so right. we had, you know, we had a, a short little conversation. That's you know, awesome. as, as I recall, she says, "Have you seen Q?" And I said, "Right, yeah, I saw him earlier." And and she says, "I'm, I'm," you know, told me she told me she was staying at his house, and that's uh, awesome. yeah, you know. But back to that, using that as an example of the power of presence awareness for anyone listening, that's like a third party or a you can an example of what you can bring to mm. the creative work that you do if you want to make an impact if you want to get people to respond that's mm. what they're going to respond to right they're not going to respond to the great, latest greatest toy they're not going to respond to what you look like or, or sound like they're going to mm. respond to who you are and what you are sharing with them right it's right? a human connection but that's that's what art is all about yeah. I mean, you think about human connection, music predates language. So humans have been using music, even if it's just a drum in a tribe, to communicate with others. It's part of our DNA. So why not use that as a wedge or a vehicle to affect positive change, especially mm. today where everybody's, if we jump back a little bit to, yeah. to social media. Right. Right. The 20th century is all about filters. Right. Right. right? You had gatekeepers <laughs> right. along the way who would allow you to get into the game or not, whatever their criteria is. But the way that it was structured was gatekeepers. Social media and the internet completely obliterated that yeah. to where now it's, a, it's become a horizontal playing field. So we, as a culture, we were kind of forced to become our own filters. And as humans and free will and the seven deadly sins and yeah. all the rest of that is there are bad actors out there who have used that ignorance and manipulated that inexperience, a knowledge base to, for their own ends. Right. So this is now, is, you know, that's kind of like the, an outgrowth of that is if, if you think about mythology, I'm, I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and the power okay. of myth. Yep. Uh, it's a, an amazing great, book. Great. I encourage everybody to read it. But basically his contention is that the Greeks created gods mm -hmm. to create stories that would chill out the population. Right. If the population to generate a sense of certainty in their world about things they don't understand. Right. right. So as long as Apollo's got it covered, that the sun's going to come up and come up right. in the morning. Everyone's I don't have to. I can go to sleep and I can sleep soundly because I know Apollo's got We're it covered. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, no, it's no longer a worry for me. Right. right? So and so we find ourselves in a period of human history where the story has to be. We have to take back that power, mm. of the bad actors, and, and instill faith. At least in my opinion. Right in the fact that story is a way to reach people art is a way to reach people to say and an awareness that if we are not connected we won't survive because right. we're not autonomous and we'll go down all this you know this political yeah. nonsense and all the rest of that which we right. that continues to separate us as, as people mm. right. Where, whereas whereas if we're connected yeah. not mechanically speaking no yeah. But from from a cognitive, right. humanistic level, yeah. then we have a chance of survival. Right. Similar it, in the sapiens, right? Like it's similar yeah, culture. it's 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 yeah. you know the time is now to stand up, right, and to, to make that happen. In my belief, it's going to happen on a community by community basis. Mm. 
Right. It's not going to come from somebody on high yeah. saying, oh, everything's okay with the world. Right. Right. It's because it's going to come from from a groundswell from the grassroots to right. say, I know how to deal with the uncertainty in my right. life. Right. That's powerful. You said you have a six and a three year old grandchild. I do. Let's fast forward 35, 40 years. They're listening to this podcast. What's the message that you give them? Well, I hope you're happy. Mm. Mm. You know, I mean, is it in that, that you've learned something along the way. My, my six-year-old granddaughter, is she's an artist. Like a year and a half ago, she was listening to a piece of music before she went to sleep. I was, and five, she was probably five years old at the time. Mm. She knew all the lyrics. She sang it in tune and she vocalized the guitar solo. Wow. And I'm thinking, and she draws incessantly. Love it. And I'm thinking, Okay, I know who this little girl. Is. <laughs> I I to, I totally get it. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. yeah, I mean, listen, I, you know, the other thing I would say, which would be, well, I hope what uh, you learned from me helped you along your way. Mm. That's awesome. You know, yeah, because uh, you know, who knows what the world's going to look like? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I like it. Well, Chris, this has been great. I've got two last questions to sure. um, kind of wrap us up here. This has been extremely um, powerful, and I think our listeners are going to find it super moving, but also insightful. We do this with every guest. We It's kind of a fill in the blank, so to speak. So, okay. Before I became a composer, I wish I would have known that blank. I wish I would have known how impactful my emotional well-being was. Mm right that i needed to be a whole person right. to get the most out of the gift that i had been given wow in order to be a great composer i've learned that the most important skill to work on is being curious constantly learning and i wouldn't say tolerant but appreciative of people's differences because all of that experience becomes grist for the mill for using a, my, one of my parents phrases but it, it becomes fodder for the work that you do because the job of a composer is to interpret their emotions and use music as a language to be able to express that emotional intent. Sometimes it's a release. Sometimes it's to guide people. You know, it, there's varying different ways that, that it can manifest itself. Mm. Yeah, stay open. Keep learning. Be curious. Take okay. chances. Take risks. Fall down. Get back yeah. up again. It's awesome. Chris, thank you so much for joining. Really oh, appreciate the conversation. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's been a blast. Thank you so much. If you want to know how to create like the grades, let's break it down.